Uh, our next speaker is Professor Luca Befrale, and he's going to be talking about data-driven tools for Lagrangian turbulence. Thank you, Kartik. Thank you. Thank you for, to the organizers also for having me here. It's a great pleasure. The workshop was extremely interesting. I hope I will not decrease too much the quality of the presentations. And um, yeah, today I, I will tell you something about uh, um, uh, a game that we started to play uh, since a couple of years ago uh, with uh, my group in Rome, the name of the, the, name of the collaborators you can see uh, listed here, and which is uh, strongly connected to using data-driven tools for turbulence. So the title might, might, looks a little bit, might look a little bit misplaced in this conference. Um, so why the hell we should to use uh, black box tools to address the theory in the experiments and turbulence or a few theories uh, uh, issues? And uh, I will indeed uh, try to, to use uh, uh, the need of, uh, of, um, of uh, attacking problems with data-driven black box tools as a motivation connected to the fact that there are many theoretical and phenomenological things that we do not understand uh, in turbulence. And therefore, I mean, the only, the only way we have is uh, to, uh, to attack the problem with uh, you know, brute force, uh, uh, numerical, uh, and machine learning uh, uh, algorithms. So uh, I will speak mainly about Lagrangian turbulence. What do I mean for Lagrangian turbulence? I mean that I will uh, try to to uh, understand what are the properties of a tracer that is, uh, uh, that is uh, advected by uh, a velocity field, the velocity field that solves uh, the Navier-Stokes equations. So it's a pure tracer, it's a molecule of my flow, it's a passive molecule of my flow that goes around, and I would like to understand what are the properties of uh, trajectories and velocities, accelerations uh, seen by this uh, particle that, that uh, uh, swims and that uh, goes around in, in, in the flow. If I have time, I will also say a few words about the possibility to control the problem, so to have an active uh, part. But for the moment, please uh, forget this. Uh, the, the first part of the talk will be fully devoted uh, to these things. So, so what we have, we have a particle that goes around. This is x, the position. There will be a velocity at the position t time t, and then I will look at the same particle at a later time where the, it will see the, the position at time t plus tau at the, at the, at the time at time t plus tau in my, in my underlying velocity flow. And the issue is to understand, uh, per, uh, for example, what are the statistics of these velocity increments? So typically, we would like to understand what is the property of, uh, of the velocity increments. At the two different times that I will call delta tau v along my along my trajectory. So this is what people call uh, uh, Lagrangian turbulence for a single particle for the problem for a single particle uh, trajectory. Then there are many other Lagrangian problems connected to two particles, multiparticles, and so on and so forth. But I will mainly speak only speak about statistical properties ar ar around one Lagrangian trajectory. This is very different from uh, I mean very different, but not completely, but different from what people typically do in the Eulerian frame that we have seen many times in this conference, where you fix the position x and x plus r, and you want to understand what are the statistical properties of the field at a fixed uh, given distance r by changing r. This is what we typically call the Eulerian, the Eulerian uh, 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 structure function, or Eulerian increments, and these are the Lagrangian the Lagrangian increments. And typically what we are interested to understand is whether, what are the statistical properties of these Lagrangian, Lagrangian increments that are called the Lagrangian structure functions. And we expect that these will go like a tau to some exponent which depends in a trivial way from P, from the order of the moments in the inertia range. So for tau between a viscous scale and some large scale uh, correlation length. And we know that these things will go like tau to the p for tau much larger than the viscous scale because the flow must become differentiable. And uh, we know that there is a highly non-trivial physics 
around the viscous scale, because this is something that is also fluctuating wildly in my flow. And so the kind of question that I would like to understand is, how much do we know about these properties? And in particular, if the, we have a tool, a phenomenological model that is able to reproduce, to generate uh, synthetic trajectories uh, in, uh, uh, as the ones that we can measure in direct numerical simulations. Why we want to, why we want, oops, does it work? Yes. So uh, the idea will be to use and uh, to, to, to show you that we are able to, to build up black box stochastic models that are able to start from a pure random noise and produce Lagrangian trajectories that are undistinguishable, uh, statistically speaking, and the quantitatively speaking from what we observe in direct numerical simulation. And my claim is that these uh, tools that we are able to build by using a machine learning uh, approach are much better than whatever we, uh, we knew uh, until, uh, uh, until we tried with, this, uh, with these new uh, algorithms and that they are able to capture physical aspects that indeed we were not able to model uh, uh, in a different way. So um, why you want to do that? Because I mean, the first, uh, the first uh, uh, question that you need to ask is why. Well, uh, there are many reasons indeed why we, want, we would like to have a stochastic model that is able to, to generate these trajectories. The first reason is that because if you have a model that is able to generate the trajectory, it means that we have understood what are the ingredients that you need to put to reproduce the right physics. Right? Yeah, but, the, the, but, but, but in a way that you don't understand how, right? So the idea is that uh, suppose I have a very simple model on Sayulenbeck model that is perfectly reproducing my trajectory, it tells me, okay, there is only one time scale, it's, uh, all, all the rest is Gaussian. I know that the main physics is captured by that particular phenomenology. My message is that see, because the phenomenology is going to be very complicated, we need to have a very sophisticated model to generate these trajectories. And therefore, I mean, if suppose you are able to really do and to, to produce something that is synthetically built up from scratch, it means that you have understood a lot about the physics. The second reason why this is an applied reason why you would like to have models that are able to produce these trajectories is because you might need a lot of statistics to test other things, right? And in particular, concerning Lagrangian trajectories, it's very highly non-trivial to produce them. Because even if, even if you want to reproduce and to produce a, one single new trajectory, you need to do the whole simulation of the flow in the whole, in the whole volume, or you need to, to redo the experiment. Then there are other uh, um, uh, uh, possible uh, motivations, is that if I suppose I know how to generate uh, these signals, then this might be extremely important to solve many applied problems concerning that augmentation, that is, um, for instance, uh, by refilling or impainting uh, trajectories where you, you miss for some reasons because you cannot observe, because your sensor was not sending the right signals. So you miss some information along your trajectories. And of course, if you want to, to refill these, 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 these gaps, you need to know what to put inside. And you need to know how to correlate with the data that you have. Then there are also other motivations, but I mean, concerning classifications of different particles, but I mean, I, I don't want to enter into this. Uh, into these uh, uh, issues. So why uh, the problem is tough? The problem is tough because it is now, I would say, at least uh, 20 years that uh, thanks to the fantastic work of uh, experimentalists and then follow up by other works by numerical people, uh, we started to measure these, uh, these properties, these Lagrangian properties in turbulence, and people realized that uh, they, are, they, they are highly non-trivial. For instance, here I show the trajectory of one particle uh, advected by a turbulent flow, an homogeneous isotropic turbulent flow. You see that it fluctuates more or less in a mild way for most of the time. And then from, from time to time, it enters in highly non-trivial small vortex structures and starts to fluctuate in a crazy way. And uh, indeed, I mean, if you measure the acceleration of this guy, um, you really see that it, you might uh, change by order of magnitudes during the evolution of one single trajectory, the signal that you are, uh, that you are measuring. So the, the signal is strongly non-Gaussian and highly, highly non-trivial. 
you might quantify that by using, uh, as I was writing here, um, moments of these of this Lagrangian velocity, velocity increments. And uh, for instance, a way to quantify it in a very systematic way, which is, uh, I mean, uh, independent of any kind of uh, uh, fitting, is to measure the flatness. And so you measure the moments of order four divided the square root of the moment of order two. And if everything is almost trivial, you expect the moment of order four goes, uh, is proportional to the square root of the moment of order two. So you expect, if the statistics is, is almost trivial, you expect this guy to be almost independent of tau. While when you measure in a, in, a, in, a, in a turbulent flow, you see that the flatness goes from the value of three that is proper over the Gaussian statistics where the time scale is very large to values that can be easily 10 times larger. If you measure higher order moments, the, 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 the departure from Gaussianity is even two decades, three decades. So uh, the system is uh, clearly showing a highly non-trivial multi-scale properties, strongly non-Gaussian, and uh, uh, this non-Gaussianity is extreme when you look at very small time scales because you are sensitive to the derivatives of this, of this, uh, of this, uh, of this field, which means the acceleration. And indeed, indeed, if you measure the acceleration of a particle inside a turbulent flow, you, uh, you find a PDF like the ones that I show you here. This is in log lean, is the PDF of the acceleration normalized with the root mean square. And you see that you can easily reach fluctuations that are 40, 50, 60 times the root mean square, which is a clear signature of a strong, strong non-Gaussian uh, non uh, non -Gaussian properties. So you have a fat tails, extreme events, and so on and so forth that we have already seen also in other observable, for other observables during this work. So uh, the point is that we have, uh, my claim is that we have no way to use and to have a phenomenological model that is reproducing these properties. It is producing trajectory with a one-to-one -one quantitative agreement with what we measure. So if somebody comes to me and asks, okay, give me a stochastic model to have a good uh, synthetic uh, example, uh, uh, unless I use the tool that I'm going to tell you in a few slides, uh, we were not able to do it. Just to give you an idea of the quality of the data that we have in our community, I will spend five minutes in discussing this, uh, uh, this picture. Because whenever you say undistinguishable, depends on what you mean. I mean, what do, what do you compare, right? So for instance, now in our community, since at least 20 years, or maybe 15 years ago, the experimental numerical data are so good that for instance, in order to check the properties of a curve like this, we went much behind the idea of doing uh, log log fits in, uh, in, uh, and, and trying to, to, to fit the power law behavior in different regimes. And the people, have, people have, data, have learned to collect data good enough to uh, measure the uh, logarithmic derivative of this curve. So uh, to go at each time scale and to see how much the slope changes by changing the time scale. So you move from measuring things that change by one decade, two decades, to give an assessment of, because you measure the slope, to give an assessment on numbers that are order one on four decades in time scales. These are not fits, these are measurements. There is no fit at all. This is just a collection of an eight numerical and experimental measurements of the log-log slope of a curve like this, of a curve like this, on the best experiments in numerical simulations that we had at that time. This is the result of a uh, multi-authors collaborations. Now we have even better data thanks to the effort of uh, Kartik, P.K. Young, and, 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 and Srini. So we have data at a larger Reynolds number. And what you show here is that uh, there are a few things that are very important to understand, to understand the, the complexity of the signal. First of all, you see that uh, um, the statistical properties of a quantity like this are, un is, uh, are universal. What do I mean for universal? I mean that you might compare very different numerical simulations, different large scale forcing, different uh, experiments, so with different boundary conditions. And the numbers, when you boil down them to measure something order one, the numbers go on top one of the other within error bars within a few percent. So we are measuring local scaling properties 
on four decades within a few percent comparing different experiments and we find the same results. So turbulence, like this kind of, at least this kind of observable are strongly universal. It, they are independent on the way you produce three-dimensional turbulence. This is the first, the first very important message that was indeed in the title of, 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 the, of the journal, of the publication. The second message, as I already said, by looking at the, at the log derivative, you are able to assess not the global scaling properties, but the scaling properties uh, uh, scale by scale at the different times. And you see that you observe what people call an inertia range because you measure the same scaling properties independently on tau. So this is a plateau. It means that it, it, it would be a power law if you look at, uh, on log log. Then you measure for very small time scale a saturation to a value in this case two, which is connected to this behavior, to the behavior that for very small time scale, it must be dissipative. And what is even more interesting and more important is that in between of the full dissipative behavior, so in between of when tau is very small and the inertia range here, there is a huge range of scales, almost uh, more than one decade, where the scaling is neither pure power law, nor, so neither inertial, nor fully viscous, but there is even you know, an, an increase, uh, sorry, a decreasing of this uh, scale by scale scaling exponent, which means that you have an increasing in intermittency. Uh, why it is so? Because I remind you that, I mean, it's very easy to show that if these, uh, these local scaling exponents would be equal to this value, then flatness would not change. Then you would have simply a Gaussian uh, output at all, uh, at all time scales. So this, uh, this is uh, somehow this sets a standard. If you are a theoretician and you come out with a new theory to, to produce and to, and to, and to control, this observable, you need to be able to reproduce this curve. And for instance, in the inertia range, you need to be able to give us a theory that, uh, that is uh, within this, this number, within a one or 2% from, uh, from these numbers. Then there is another message that I would like to send because it's the yellow curve. The yellow curve uh, is uh, what we know how to predict with zero free parameters for this behavior, starting from the Eulerian statistics. What does it mean? I suppose that somebody gives me what the field in the Eulerian uh, framework uh, uh, does. So for instance, somebody gives me what the, let me write it here. Somebody gives me the Eulerian structure function Fixed distance tells me that this is goes like zeta p. Let me call it Eulerian for r in the inertia range, and this goes like r to the p, of course, for r much smaller than uh, than, than the viscous scale. So somebody gives me these numbers. Uh, of course, we don't know how to calculate them. So I mean, uh, uh, unfortunately, we don't know. We don't know. We don't have a theory to predict them. But I mean, you can measure. You can measure in your linear experiments. We have seen many already measurements of these numbers. So you can measure these numbers. You out of these numbers, out of the zeta p, Eulerian, you know, using the multifractal phenomenology, that these are connected to the set, the fractal set, uh, in your Eulerian, Eulerian framework where you see a particular scaling exponent h. And therefore, out of, this, uh, out of this prediction, you can invert the transform and extract the phenomenologically measured the set of fractal dimensions from the Eulerian field. Then what is very easy to cook up is a bridge relation that connects what you measure in the Eulerian with what you, observe, you should observe in the Lagrangian. The relation is not trivial, for instance, uh, if the Eulerian structure, if the Eulerian exponent goes like that, the Lagrangian exponent should be given by this, this formula, which is a different, a different shape. You use the same 
things that you have measured from the Eulerian field and you predict what you should observe for the, for the, for the Eulerian, for the Lagrangian uh, evolution. And the, the, phenomen the multifractal phenomenology is good enough not only to predict uh, the plateau, but also to predict this uh, oscillation, this increase of intermittency due to the fluctuations of the viscous scale. And you see that the prediction is not a straight line. Why? Because you have uncertainties on this quantity. I mean, this quantity we cannot calculate from first principle, so we need to extract from the data. So we have error bars. And the error bars on this D of H gives me a prediction for the Lagrangian curve plus uh, minus some error. So it is, we, are, uh, we are living in a very frustrating situation where we have a highly non-trivial physics, which is connected, uh, uh, the departure from this quantity is connected to intermittency. So for instance, the departure of this quantity from two is connected to the fact that these tails in the acceleration are not the one predicted by this black line. So it's really a, a huge effect. And uh, so we have a very good data, numerical and experimental data. We have a phenomenology that is able, using this multifractal bridge relation, to predict pretty well these numbers. But we have no way how to build up a signal in time that has exactly these properties. When I say we have no way, this is, for instance, a list of, a list of papers in the last 30 years that have tried. Some of them have, are very successful to produce some aspects of this curve, maybe this deep, maybe this plateau, but there is not a single one, believe me, that is able to reproduce the whole behavior. And the reason is that this deep, this announcement of intermittency, which is connected to the fat tails in the acceleration, is indeed strongly non-locally connected to what you see here. So it's, uh, it's highly non-trivial to build up a signal that is uh, highly, in some sense, uh, correlated among scales, because what happens in the viscous regime is connected to the inertial range. And indeed, I mean, I don't say that it's impossible, but I'm just saying that uh, we are not able to do it. So what we decided to do is to use, uh, uh, we don't know how to do it with, uh, in a phenomenological way. Let's use uh, data-driven tools and see if machines are able to learn the statistical properties such that I can reproduce these things and they can build up trajectories. What we did, we used these uh, very powerful models that are very nice because are linked to the physics, to physics, uh, that, that goes under the name of diffusion models. Diffusion models exist in the, in the literature from, from um, computer, uh, uh, in the computer science, uh, science literature since uh, no more than three, four years ago. And in the last two years, they are now, uh, they became the model that the community that, uh, that, that use this kind of machine learning approach to generate the data uh, uh, uses. The idea is very simple. So I would like a stochastic model. I mean, after all, Navier-Stokes is the same, right? You force it stochastically and produce a trajectory, right? Navier-Stokes is a machine that you give a stochastic forcing in input and produce trajectories. I would like now to have a machine, completely black box, that I give you, I, I give random numbers in input and produce a trajectory. And the idea of this diffusion model is very simple because the idea is to, is to anti-diffuse, that is to invert a diffusion process. Suppose you have a Langevin equation. Well, uh, very simple with a quadratic potential. Then it's, uh, it's, it's very, you can solve analytically and you know that you can start from any distribution at time zero. If you wait long enough, at time uh, long enough, you're going to be Gaussian and uh, you have a, 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 a Gaussian distribution. And you, Eta here is a random noise. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, at, at the moment, let me just make this example the real on the process. Hmm? I start from any initial distribution of time zero. I add the noise. I wait long enough. At the final time, I'm going to be uh, Gaussian distributed. So I start from any initial distribution of uh, distribution of cats or dogs. I started to add the noise to each of these pixels. I wait long enough, at the end I, am, I have a, a, Gaussian, uh, a Gaussian image, completely uncorrelated. The idea of this diffusion model is to revert this. 
So to learn how to start from a pure Gaussian distribution and to invert the propagator and to produce the distribution of images that you had uh, at the beginning. Of course, this is highly non-trivial way because you don't know what is the evolution of this. In reality, you don't know what is the initial distribution, so you don't know what is the evolution of this, of this propagator. And how these machine learning tools uh, proceed, they proceed by trial and error. I mean, by you, show, you show examples and you minimize a cost. So in practice, what you do is the following. You start from, you have a, a training phase. Of course, this is supervised learning, so you must have trajectories the real trajectories. In our case, we had uh, 300,000 trajectories extracted from a direct numerical simulation. So you start from an ensemble of trajectories. You have these uh, 300,000 trajectories like this one, uh, out of which you can calculate all the observable that have these uh, very, very funny statistics. And then you, you produce in the training phase parallel data sets where starting from a trajectory, you produce one parallel data set where you have added a very small amount of noise. Then you produce another trajectory where you have added a little bit more noise, and you continue like that for thousands and thousands of steps until at the end you have, of course, pure noise. So you have many, many examples of trajectories with no noise, a little bit of noise, a little bit more of noise, and the end with a lot of noise. And then what you do, you train a machine learning, a neural network, to invert these steps. You show the very noisy trajectory, and you show what you had one step before, and you train a neural network to, to, to denoise. And the, the very clever idea of this diffusion model is that because you do it step by step with very small amount of noise from one step to another one, you may hope that the condition of probability to denoise is still Gaussian, and therefore, you simply train a neural network that gives you a Gaussian distribution conditioned on what you had at the, at the, at the step before. It seems magic, but uh, I mean, since uh, two years ago, the, the machine learning community generating images uh, is only using these kind of models. And I give you, I show you, okay, this I don't mean, I don't want to enter into details of this. I show you a few results. First of all, we were able to do something that is highly non-trivial, that is to generate the three, the three components simultaneously. So it's not only a one-dimensional signal. It's, these are three, because the velocity field, of course, is a, is, a, is a vector. So such that we, can, we should be able really to reconstruct the trajectory, even with its topological uh, structure. So for instance, here I show you three, one example of the three components generated uh, by, by this, by this uh, diffusion model once you have trained. And you see that, I mean, when it, it, it learns how to generate vortex filaments. Because when one component starts to oscillate, also the other two components start to oscillate. And indeed, if you compare what you see in the real DNS with what you produce from your diffusion model, I mean, at least visually like that, it's really, it's really undistinguishable. Of course, I mean, we, are not, we, cannot, uh, we cannot limit ourselves to, to, to visual uh, comparison. Here, for instance, I show the PDF of the velocity increments at the different uh, time legs tau, uh, starting from very large time where the PDF is Gaussian. This is very easy to generate, right? A signal like that. And then we decrease the time legs and the black curves are the DNS and the blue curves are the data gen generated by the diffusion model. And uh, uh, please notice here, there is a, 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 an important thing to, to stress. Um, once you have trained the model, once you have this black box stochastic model, you can run it forever, right? So you can generate billions of trajectories. And here we, we play it by generating a number of trajectories that is 100 times larger than the original model. And you see that the model seems to do something that is a magic to generalize, right? To produce events that have never been seen, more intense than any of the events used in the training, which is highly, highly non-trivial, highly non-trivial fact, as if, as if the model has really learned the real underlying uh, physics. And therefore, you, you run it more, and it will generate a more and more realistic situation. Then you can play, of course, and visually uh, try to understand how it generates the final trajectory starting from a random uh, Brownian motion, because at, at the beginning, it's a random Brownian motion, and so on and so forth. But then let me show you more quantitative results. These are the structural functions as a function of the moments, P2, 4, and 6. The black dot are, again, the, the ground truth, the DNS. 
and the, the orange and the blue is uh, using this diffusion model either to generate the three components simultaneously or one component only. When you generate, uh, and these are the flatness of order four, six, eight. Here you see what I was mentioning before. When you look at the flatness of very high moments, you have signals that changes between uh, you know, uh, three, on a six order of magnitudes. You see that the model is pretty, when, it, when you generate one component only, it is very good until almost the very last uh, time scale. For the three components is less, is, less, uh, is less efficient, but I mean, for a huge range of scales in, is a, in real perfect agreement. And again, again, uh, instead of fitting things in log log, let's look at order one parameters at a different time scales. And so I show you here the uh, log derivative of this curve. And uh, these are the uh, obtained by, by the original uh, DNS data, so the ground truth, and the, the, the data produced from, from, from the diffusion model. And these are, this is the original data that I was showing a few slides ago. Com Sorry? No, the black dots are the ground truth, are the DNS data. And the two diffusion models, the one that produce one only one component or three components are the blue and the orange the things. The three component is slightly less performant, but you have, it's much more difficult. It's, it's much more difficult, uh, much more difficult task. So the statement is that we have, a, we have a, a, a black box, a stochastic tool that is able to match intermittency at, on four order, uh, on four decades uh, on, uh, with an agreement that is, uh, that is uh, a few percent. And I repeat, this is the first, uh, the first time I see something like that uh, for, uh, for Lagrangian turbulence. Uh, not everything is perfect. For instance, this is the PDF of the acceleration. Again, the black dot is the DNS, the ground truth. The blue is, my, is our diffusion model. You see that it, it is slightly under uh, and their uh, uh, perform for very large events. And this, I think we, we, we think we understand it, we, we, that you can see also here. Uh, I think we can, we understand it because the DNS data are slightly under resolved. So they are not fully differentiable. Huh? On the other hand, you know, the diffusion model uh, is, is forced to be differentiable. I mean, it, it, it is based on, <laughs> on a differentiable machines. And therefore, I mean, we, we, we tend to, be, to, be, to, to, to believe that if one would have used a better DNS, then one should have been able also to match very, very good, in a very, very quantitative way, the, the, very, the, the, the small time scale, the small time scale limit. Then, uh, then there is the, the big question about what do you learn? At the moment, we didn't learn too much. We have a tool. We have a tool to generate the data. The next question is to open the tool, right? And try to understand if one can learn what the tool learns to build up this highly non-trivial uh, non non signal. Um, one minute, so I will, not, I will not tell you how we are using these to, to refill gaps, because this, then once, once you have this, this tool to generate the data, you can use the tool to refill gaps, supposing that you don't have data, so to correlate with the context and producing something that is statistically uh, realistic, this is still uh, unpublished, but I mean, uh, it's just, uh, let me skip about that and let me go, let me go to the conclusions. Um, and uh, 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 summarizing uh, uh, two, main, uh, two main messages, the two main positive message is that once you generate, once you train, you have trained the model, then generating the trajectory is, uh, very easy, you can really generate billions of them. So uh, these machines are certainly useful to generate realistic 3D trajectories of tracers in homogeneous and isotropic turbulence. And I mean, you can imagine it should be easy to, to, be, to generalize them to different trajectories. You might have inertial particles, you might have uh, other kinds of particles. It should, should, I mean, the machine should, should be as, as good as in this case. Um, and they have a very good quantitative agreement with multi-scale statistical properties. There are a few, a few things that are completely missing. Uh, one, uh, we have a very little understanding of the generalization issue. I mean, what happens when you try to, to, to produce things that are out of the sample? I show you that concerning the extreme events, they seem very promising. We have very little statistical 
uh, checks of that. And we know nothing about uh, generalization of different trainers. So training at different trainers and see how much it learns how to, how to guess the statistics at different trainers. Uh, we have, um, we have uh, and this is the worst message, uh, the most pessimistic message, is that we have no way to predict how complex the, the, the neural network must be depending on the complexity of the data that you want to produce. So uh, we have been successful uh, using a, a given architecture. If you now give me data that I have Reynolds numbers 10 times larger, uh, I don't know how to predict which kind of network I have to use. I mean, I have to go there and trial and error and, and, and cooking different hyperparameters. And then the other question that I was starting to discuss uh, earlier is that um, the tool now must be open. And uh, I mean, we need to try to understand what there is inside and asking, you know, what if questions, changing things uh, and understanding what the network is learning to, to try to understand the physics. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions for the speaker? Sir, please. Uh, hi, Luca. Uh, just a quick question on the DNS itself. The dip that you showed, uh, are all those different simulations done for close to same Reynolds number, or there's no. a large variability there? No, no, no. Indeed, I mean, I didn't say all the truth. This uh, yellow, of, this, the, the Reynolds number is, uh, what is it? I'm going in the wrong direction. The, the, the Reynolds number is cited in the figure. It doesn't uh, give me one second. It's periodic, uh, no, PowerPoint is a mess. Anyhow, Reynolds number is slightly different. And, uh, okay, here we are, huh? uh, almost there, almost there. Here it is. Reynolds number is slightly different. It is, it is uh, mentioned here. And indeed, the yellow curve takes into account of the fact that in the multifractal formalism, you predict as a small deviation uh, dependency on the Reynolds numbers on the deep, and indeed you also see it. So the yellow curve is also taking into account of this, uh, of this Reynolds number dependency. That's why you are saying that if you change the training data set, the dips might be different. The dips might be different. The dips might be different and the trajectory must be different. And what we did up to now is to train only on one Reynolds number data set. Thanks, Luca. So just to understand how this works. So once you have trained the network, you feed the net to generate a new time series. Random feed... noise. Gaussian. Uh, in our case, the trajectory was uh, uh, 2,000 uh, uh, time steps, uh, 2,000 random, uh, identically Gaussian. independently distributed Gaussian numbers. And it, it starts to correct it. In, in and the... at the end, I mean, uh, I show you, you, if you see what is producing at a different step during the anti-diffusion, you produce at the beginning you are Gaussian, then in the intermediate step of the anti-diffusion you start to build up the, the, the small frequencies, the large frequencies, the small frequencies, and then you start to build up more and more signal with more and more uh, high frequency detail. Okay, so then I have a question. So then the question is the following: Have you tried using this to identify precursors? So. What happens in the time series before an extreme event? Uh, yeah, this is what uh, this is this, this is this problem. If you want, it is uh, mm -hmm. is uh, is in painting only in the future. So it's you have a past and you want to you want to predict what it is uh, in the future. I mean, it will statistically speaking, it will identify extreme events perfectly because it produce it produces the statistics perfectly. I mean, the, the, the acceleration is almost identical. Concerning the one-to-one -one correlation with the past, you will never beat the Japanese exponent. I mean, that's, uh... So uh, there's just so many models. I, I'm totally ignorant. Uh, how how does neural network compare with the diffusion model, for example? Uh, normal neural network models, diffusion. If you use it, if you use other other neural networks like. For instance, uh, the, there is a family that is very popular too, that is generative adversarial networks, the GANs. Uh, they, are, they, they are able to reproduce some of these features, but not as good as the diffusion model. In particular, I mean, GANs, I mean, as, as, as much as we tried, they are not able to, to predict the transition this deep 
in a in an accurate way. We have in the preprint we have results also about the guns. If you use guns, you you have a, a big mismatch here. They are not able to understand that the, the, when you join the two physics, you needed to join in this highly non-trivial way. Okay, I, I have just two quick questions. Uh, can you do this for velocity? In principle, yes, sure. In principle, yes. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean that's. I mean this is this is my dog, right? I mean uh, th this is my dog. I mean my 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 uh, my duty is to recover a trajectory like this, right? And uh, I mean uh, statistically speaking, I don't have one single observable that allows me to distinguish between the DNS and the, the data generated by this. But I mean I would love to have. I mean so I mean if if there are uh, you know. Uh, proposals on what to measure to try to distinguish. I would love to see that there are things that are not captured. I, mean, I would love. Just qu a quick comment. Maybe you should measure the third odd odd moments. Maybe you'll see well, some third, third order moments for the velocity for the Lagrangian are zero, right? Yeah, but what does the model show? Does it show zero as well? The oh well, I I, I think so. I mean, I think so. What might be highly non-trivial, but and we have to do it. Uh, as Grisha knows, uh, Lagrangian trajectories breaks uh, time symmetry. So there are observables that should be ins either inside the trajectory that tells you that uh, there is a, an error of time. And this we didn't try yet. I mean, but so I, I would, I mean, uh, I realized it uh, yesterday. So I, I, we will try to see if it is also able to produce trajectories that are not completely time reversal. Great. Mahinda, yeah. So what about earthquake predictions? Can we use it for earthquake predictions or? It's the earthquake predictions. This one um, looks like it's very good, so. Uh, well, I mean, statistically, statistically, yes. I mean, I think so. Statistically, yes. I mean, I, I don't think the, the time series of an earthquake is much more complicated than what we have here. The problem is that you need hundreds of time or, or, or thousands of uh, trajectories to train. I mean, this is highly, you really need to have a very good statistics. So, you know, earthquakes depends on how much they are reproducible and stationary and things like that. So it's... Uh... Uh, on that note, let's thank our speaker once again, and let's uh, break for tea.